Good evening and welcome to Fort William Mountain Festival 2021. Um, this is the running night. I'm Finlay Wild. I'm a runner living in Fort William and I'm delighted tonight to be talking about the Monroe Round with um, my two guests, um, both the current record holder and previous record holder, Donnie Campbell and Stephen Pike. Uh, welcome both of you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Finley. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll just ask you first, actually, just to, to introduce yourselves. Tell us a bit about yourselves. Maybe, Donnie, you go first. Uh, cool. So, um, I was I'm Donnie. Um, I'm on here because I've ran some in Rose uh, last year. But my background, I grew up in Isle of Sky. Uh, I played shinty from an early age. So that was my first sport. I had many a boisterous game with the Fort William team. Um <laughs> Um, yeah, so I played that up to probably Scotland under 17 level and then joined the Marines at the age of 18 and I was, sorry, joined the Marines at the age of 17 and I was in Iraq in 2003 in Operation Intellic at the age of 18. Um, yeah, did that for three and a half years, left the Marines, went to university to study sports coaching and development and it's from then I kind of got into kind of trail running and mountain running. A friend at the time suggested I come and do the Scottish Ultra, which was organized by Sandbaggers at the time, which is like a 150 mile MDS multi-stage type race over at Isle of Jura. Uh, so I did that, I think it was in 2008, 2009, maybe. Um, and yeah, that's where I kind of fell in love running up and down hills. Uh, before that, I was just basically running to keep fit or running to play football or shinty, so yeah. That's kind of my background into kind of trail running. Brilliant. Yeah, um, Spike, uh, you're a well-known fell runner. Um, yeah, can you tell us a bit about, about your background? Yeah, well, I, I suppose born opposite end of the, the British Isles to, to Dunny, so I'm actually a, a soft southerner from Essex. So, um, and I, yeah, I, I didn't really get into running probably into my 30s. So I yeah, went off to university. I did the usual sports, football, rugby, um, probably late 20s, really, when I sort of moved away from university and um, finding other ways of keeping fit that I sort of slowly got into running. Um, and then really the area I lived at that point, which was sort of Midlands of England, Staffordshire, um, not really fell running country. So at that point, it was really just road and cross country um, and sort of got quite into that, got quite fit and discovered it was actually compared to I guess my previous efforts at football and rugby I was actually okay at it um, and yeah I got quite keen sort of running at sort of county level and cross country and things um, and it probably wasn't really till sort of late late 30s that I suppose sort of interest in just regularly going out and doing road races and stuff sort of started to dwindle and that then converged I guess with my other sort of great love I suppose of just going out hill walking and I sort of discovered the Munros and the Highlands of Scotland a few years ago. So I was probably finding I was spending more time out hill walking in Scotland than running training. And it was really, yeah, sort of that sort of age, late 30s, that I suppose the two of those sort of converged. And I really started to get into to fell running, really. And then um, sort of the whole sort of series of, sort of chance meetings with various people and got encouraged to do some of these longer distance type runs. And a bit like, Donnie says it becomes a bit addictive at that point and really gets you, draws you into it. And yeah, and I suppose that's it really. It was, a lot of it was around just adventure and fun and just doing things like that. And that's sort of really, yeah, how I got into it all. And that probably takes us quite nicely to telling people about um, what is the Monroe Round? Because you obviously got the record in 2010. Um, yeah, what's, um, what's the idea for, for those who haven't heard of it? Shall I go on that one, Donnie, or do you want to? I'll let you go, Spike. You were the pioneer yeah. before me. Um, I mean, to be honest, yeah, it's um, it, it's a difficult one to define, really, because I suppose unlike the, the, the sort of the, the more established rounds, like the, the Bob Graham or the Charlie Ramsey round, there was a, where they've got a very set route and a format for doing it and a you know, time limit for achieving that in 24 hours. I think the Munro round is a bit more, a bit more, sort of flexible, a bit more esoteric in terms of how it's approached, because um, I mean, going back through the history, the very first continuous Munro round of someone sort of aiming to set off and complete it in one go was was back in 1974 by Hamish Munro, a sort of famous mountaineer and 
and um, mountain writer. Um, but his attempt really was very, very different, I guess, from like, you know, sort of what's happened subsequently, and that he just saw it as a big logistical challenge. And I think some, some a bit of fun to spend one summer doing it. And he he spent about three and a half months over the summer of 1974 doing it, and then subsequently wrote his book. Um, but I was lucky enough to meet him, and he said it was never about doing it as fast as he possibly could. It was about enjoying it and having fun. Um, oh, wow, you but met, I guess after you met that, Hamish Brown. Yes, I did, yeah. Shortly after my Munro round in uh, oh, wow. 2010, which is fantastic. It's a lovely bloke. We had a really good chat about it, and uh, from our different perspectives of having had that round, so that's nice, yeah. yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, and I think I think subsequent that, then various other people sort of started to do approach the Munro round, if you like, in their own ways of doing it. But there never really were any set rules. Um, and I guess Hugh Simmons in the late late eighties started to plan around Hugh Simmons being a sort of a very well known top fell runner of the nineteen eighties. Um, he did a continuous round in nineteen ninety where he basically just set off on foot and ran all the Munros and then carried on with all the other three thousand footers in the British Isles. And I guess that was probably the first one that really got it on the map of the, the fell running fraternity, if you like. And then um, the various people after that sort of had their own goes at it. But, you know, there was um, a, two Scottish runners, Andrew Johnson and Rory Gibson, a couple of years later, did it as a continuous run stroke bike challenge together. And then they brought um, Hugh Simmons' time down to about 51 and a half days. And then in 2000, Charlie Campbell, the Glaswegian postman, he decided he was going to have his go at it. So he similarly did a, 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 a under his own steam type of round. So basically he, he sort of ran bike and actually swam across from Mol to the mainland. So if you like, he sort of, I guess, set, at that point, certainly when I was doing it, he set the record of the time and I guess sort of set the framework of what the rules were. Although I think even now there's not a really set sort of structures to exactly what the rules are rather than I think you do it under your own steam and start and finish where you like and as long as you cover all all of the whichever the designated Monroe peaks are at that time that's that's really the rules. I mean it's absolutely yeah mind-boggling that you're talking about the record coming down from what 100 and 112 days or something to like yeah. like you said 51 days and then obviously it came it became even quicker. Um, it's just such a huge, long undertaking. Um, Donny, uh, not to put you on the spot, but do, do you want to talk about the stats, kind of the overall, um, don't know if you have, I've got them here if you... you <laughs> yeah, you're probably best to go to the stats, and I'm not really a stats person. <laughs> I get asked this all the time, is like, how far did you run? Or, you know, uh, I heard you climbed 14 Everest. It's seemingly the, the stat that always sticks out there, and I'm like... Well, that's what Strava or whatever calculated out. Yeah, but yeah, you probably got more direct stats, but I think it was like a thousand odd K and a thousand odd, thousand odd K running, thousand odd K cycling. And like, yeah, as I said, about 14 Everest, whatever that works out in meters. But yeah, I think you've got them written down somewhere. <laughs> was it 140,000 meters of ascent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if either of you have read, uh, well, Donnie, you probably have. Ali Bevan's book Broken about all the records that were getting done um, done last year and he says every journalist's go-to measure of elevation is how many times up Everest from sea level is it yeah. <laughs> which isn't really that relevant but um, yeah 14 Everest <laughs> it's interesting at least you measured it on Strava Donny. I, I my only measure of it ever was was a really sort of old-fashioned way with a piece of string and <laughs> string on a large map gave me a rough estimate and then just counting contours so i i suspect my estimate of it was never within more than better than about 10 or 20 percent of what the actual stats really are but yeah <laughs> and i suppose just for anyone who's maybe been up dozing a bit and just woken up we are talking about doing all 282 monroes uh you know in a continuous journey although yeah. that's uh that's the number of monroes has changed slightly as the tables have been updated over the years so I suppose that's another factor maybe coming into your your point, Spike, about how there isn't an exact set way of doing it. Uh, the, the goalposts have, I suppose, changed a bit over the years as, you know, there's been small changes to the exact number of Monroes. 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, certainly when uh, Hugh Simmons and um, Andrew Andrew Johnston and Roy Gibson did them, there was a big or relatively big revision of the tables back in about was it about ninety four? So they, they I'm not sure they would have done about two hundred and seventy seven, and then okay. when Charlie did it, it was two hundred and eighty four. <laughs> so I got one knocks off, knock it to knock it down when it was remeasured and it was under height. So I got two hundred eighty three, and then. I think Donny lost another one in, in the interim as well to make it down to 282. So, yeah, it keeps changing. <laughs> and I thought it might be good, Donny, to, to get you to just talk us through, like, to give an idea of the size of the days. I mean, obviously, every day was different, but, like, the first few days, like, we'll not go through the whole route, but talk us through maybe the first couple of, well, the first day and then maybe the second day to give an idea, because these are absolutely massive days you know, back to back for over a month. Cool. Um, so when I put the schedule together, um, I'll tell you about background of this first. When I put my schedule together, uh, Fair Played Spikes, like I got his schedule and I first of all thought, okay, I want to do something different. So I looked at the map for ages and tried to do something different, but Spike had the best, most efficient <laughs> method of traveling, starting on Mull, heading out east through Lagan, out to the eastern Cairngorms, head south, and then head up the northwest coast. I tried to do it different ways around, starting in Mull, maybe head south, and then up east, and then back in. But uh, basically, I copied Spikes' schedule to much of it. And basically, I just worked my schedule as in, what can I do on one given day in training? So I know on a training run on a Saturday, I can go out and run 60K with like 5,000 meters of ascent. But the, probably the following day in training, I'll have off and a couple of easy days, so on. So that's how my schedule kind of came about. It's like, okay, how much can I do in one day physically? And then I didn't really worry about covering. I just thought, how much can I do in like 12, 15 hours um, without making double work for myself? So that's how I managed to get a schedule of like 33 days together, roughly. Um, and day one, I was like one of my easier days. So the two days that kind of stuck out for me was day three, which was kind of first, it was all the Ben Alder group. I knew from Spikes' schedule, he took two days to do it and I was being ambitious to try and do it in one day. Mm -hmm. And then also on day 10, I combined two of Spikes' day into one day to try and get from um, Glen Shee over to Blair Athol uh, overnight uh, off your bivy. Uh, so that was the two biggest days that kind of really stood out for me on my schedule. But the eye opener on day one was day one actually took me 14 and a half hours and I didn't think it would take me that long. I thought it'd be like maybe a 10, 12 hour day. And that was like 14 and a half hours later, I'm getting into Glen Nevis after going from Mal up to Glen Finnan and then doing Gulvin and then coming into uh, Glen Nevis to start Ben Nevis on day two. And day two was a straightforward day. It was Ben Nevis over to Versa, over the Loch Aber Traverse and the Eastons. And yeah, that's kind of first couple of days were like that. But then with my schedule, it turned out I was doing like 16 hour days, 14 hour days, 12 hour days, 14 hour days, back to back consecutively without getting any easier days in. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty tough work in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and obviously, so you started on, um, on, on Mull, Ben Moore. So then you, then you ran a bit, did you? And then kayak. So yeah, I ran up and down Ben Moore from basically the shore up the main route and back down. Cycled over to finishish and then kayaked across to uh, Loch Allen, I think it is. And then yeah, jumped on my bike and it was like a hundred odd k cycle up uh, to Glenfinnan and then biked in Glenfinnan, did the two Monroes, biked out, cycled along, biked into Gilvin cycled up, uh, cycled back out, and then cycled into the Nevis range. I did think about joining the Glenfinnan to and Gulvin up, going cross country, but then I thought it might be more efficient to cycle in and out. That way I'd carry less kit and save the running legs. But yeah, I'm still not sure if that was the right choice on day one or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even the, just for most people, just to do that uh, day one on the bike would be, would be a massive day. I know I'd need quite a few days off just after that amount of biking, let alone all the, all the, all the running. Um, how, how does, I mean, how does that compare, I suppose, Spike, when you're remembering back to, to when you did it in 2010, like 
because you started, I think, yeah, obviously same same place, Ben Moore first. Yeah, well, I I guess just listening to Don it tells me obviously I should have been uh, pushing myself a bit harder because um, I I didn't I didn't bother with I I did, did all the first bit Donny just to uh, just, just say that again. Sorry, Spike. I think we we lost you a bit there. That one, and then about three weeks later in the round. Sorry, yeah, no. You've gone all pixely. I was just saying. I think listening to see he was pushing himself a bit harder from day one because um, that was hard when I did the two in a row, and I just called it a day at that point. Back round to to Glen Nevis, so yeah, and and I already did, and that was probably for me on day one was already a fourteen hour day, I think. So uh, yeah. Well, he he obviously had your your schedule, and he had your your record to beat. Yeah. <laughs> Are you hearing me right? Right. Uh, it's coming and going. Well, well, I'm sure it'll come back. Donny, you mentioned the Ben Alder day. Was that yep. day three? Yeah, so um, that was day three. So that's like uh, 14 Monroe's. Uh, worked out about like 64K and about five and a half thousand meters of, tra- of climbing. Um, and that starts in first set and heads over into Carrara and then over towards Ben Alder and then back over uh, Craig Petrie and back into uh lagging that way um so yeah that was like i did that as my last long run in training actually just so i could feel how it was um and yeah it took me i think about 12 hours on a training day and i think in the monroe round it maybe took me 14 hours um so yeah it was a big day uh but yeah like you know spike kind of led the way for me to give me the confidence to try for 33 days you mentioned previously about obviously i was trying to break spike's record if it wasn't for Spike setting 39 days, would I have gone for 33 days? Would I have been a bit more cautious going off um, Campbell's schedule? You know, these are the things like I knew 39 days was possible Spikes had run it. So it's like anyone else raising the bar. You just kind of have to shoot a bit lower than them and hopefully you make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that Ben Alder day, uh, I've not done it uh, as a winner, but that, as a single day, like looks like it'd be absolutely classic day out. Um, but the thought of just going on and on, actually you went into some terrible weather at, after that, didn't you? Yeah, so day four, uh, traversing North Lagan, so going from Ben Chalak all the way over to the Mona Levens, um, was actually meant to be an easier day. It was like uh, 55, 60K, but only had like under 3,000 meters of climbing, but that coincided with a weather warning of uh, horizontal rain and gale force wind. So, yeah, it was um, pretty brutal. Like, uh, yeah, it was one of these days where I actually got some great advice from um, someone just say, think like a hill walker. And that's what I had to do. It's like fully like leggings, waterproof tops, waterproof trousers, kind of hood up, jacket on, hip. Uh, hats on and just kept the head down and yeah just kind of battled away for about 10 hours and like gale force winds just traversing across north lagging and and that might be a good point to ask you about um support runners like how often were you running with people you know how often were they helping with navigation carrying stuff um, and i think we worked out afterwards uh i had a support runner for like i had company for maybe 64 of the Monroe's because obviously this was during COVID lockdown, well, not COVID lockdown, but just after COVID lockdown. So there's a lot of uncertainty and it wasn't until July that I knew I was going to be able to attempt it in August. So there wasn't that position. So it was more just who was free on the day. Um, So yeah, I had some days where I had like lots of help. So I had Ali Beaven uh, who wrote the book Broken join me for the Cairn Gorms and then Holly Page, uh, GB Elk Runner, join me for the second half of the Cairn Gorm day. And then I had some support kind of people and down around the central belt. But then I think there was a week or so I didn't have anyone, uh, which was pretty tough after a week. But yeah, it was yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. How did that affect you? Um, yeah, having so many days on your own uh, and just kind of having to, you obviously had your schedule, but having to just 
dig in and just get on with it on your own. It's kind of weird, like, I enjoy my own company sometimes, and sometimes it's quite nice not having to feel like you need to make small talk and you can just go and join with the world. And yeah, you know, you, you got a route in your mind. You're not having to ask, oh, which way is the quickest line or, you know, that. You're kind of just like, this is this is what I'm doing. I'm here by myself. So but other times it can be a bit lonely. It's quite nice to chat to people. It just takes your mind off it. But maybe you might chat too much like I did with Spike on my risk and make a big mistake. But... <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what was that mistake? Uh, so uh, Spike came to join me towards the end of um, my Monroe round. I think it would have been around about day 29 or day 30, I think. Um, I can't remember. I think it's day 29. And I wasn't expecting them there, but basically cycled up to Murrisk, which is just on the north road of just near Axe and Sheen. And it's just a small Monroe. And I met Spikes for the first time. And we just, yeah, came up the hill and we were just chatting away uh, all the way up. And if you've done Murrisk, it's there's a big cairn on the plateau. And I've never done it before. So I got there, was touched the cairn, the cloud was down and came back down. It wasn't until we were halfway down. My wife Rachel texts me saying, "Like, why haven't you gone to the cairn?" I'm like, "I have gone to the cairn. There's a big, massive cairn. We went to it to the point that I even Googled Moore's Cairn halfway down the hill, seen the cairn that we touched. Went, surely that's the summit. It wasn't until we came down and looked at the maps and realised that I missed the summit by like maybe three, four hundred meters on the plateau. So I had to go back up. I ha I have done the hill, but I, I wouldn't remember. I wouldn't have remembered that there was that sort of big false cairn and. Quite a lot of hills are a bit like that. Yeah, that must have been, yeah, gutting to get down. And Was that at the end of the day? Uh, no, I still had a few on vent to do after that. So it was like a Saturday afternoon. Uh, but it was fine. Like I had company spikes, graciously came up for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> My well, attempt to sabotage the round didn't work. <laughs> Spike, how did it feel to, uh, to meet Donnie and then to sort of obviously go back up in those hills I don't know if you've been up Marusk in between your record and his record. I haven't, no. It's, it's, certainly Marusk is not one of those hills. I mean, it's, it's a nice nice hill, but it's not one of those hills you would make a beeline to go back for. So now I haven't been up it for 10 years. So that was good because, uh, yeah, obviously the first time I'd, um, I'd met Donny and um, apart from we briefly um, exchanged a couple of emails sort of at the, at the start of the round to wish him luck and stuff. I, yeah, I didn't know too much about Donny, so... Yeah, it was good, good to meet and have a, have a good chat and find out how, well, obviously by then I knew it was going extremely well. So yeah, but it was good good to meet and just to join him on a couple of hills. So that's good. And, and were there, I'm just wondering if there were any other attempts in the intervening decade or is that the sort of first, was Donnie the first serious attempt you'd heard of? Um, there had been one, I mean, I think whether others, I don't know, but uh, Dan Duxbury is a very good fellow runner based in the, uh, Lake District runs with Ambleside Runners, so he'd, he'd had a pretty good go back in uh, 2014, um, and I think his, I think he could well have broken it, but um, fairly early on in around um, up Ben Ben Starr at the top of Glen Etive, he 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 ended up he, he had aimed at a bivy night there, and I think they'd had a bit of a in his pacer then sort of had a bit of a nightmare night where they'd lost their tent and had to come down so I think that that sort of basically I think scuppered it early on in terms of add an extra day or two and he came sort of fairly battered off the hills I think and had to take a day off but yeah so certainly there was at least one that I was aware of that one yeah okay and and Donnie going back a bit to logistics um because obviously the whole thing was a a piece of logistical masterminding <laughs> um the, the camper van and, and your wife Rachel um, obviously was your your support crew like how, how did how did that work and uh, just explain I suppose the logistics of of your sleeping and your kind of routine when you weren't exercising <laughs> uh, cool so um, with my schedule the way I worked as like I seen obviously spike and uh, I, I also spoke to Dan Duxbury and I seen that they buried out some nights and my theory was like It'd actually be better to do longer days and get back to the van because then you're going to get better recovery rather than sleeping in a sleeping bag in a boffy. So I was kind of more looking at like how much can I do to get back to the van, which is going to be my support vehicle for the 31 days. It was more home. 
And again, I know Mark Beaumont, when he cycled around the world, that he actually managed to get by on five hours sleep at night. Uh, and that's kind of like what I was fearing. I was like, the worst case scenario, as long as I get like five, six hours sleep a night, I should be able to keep going. So that was my fear is like these big days, like obviously from Glen Shee over to Blair Affle, it ended up being like a 16 hour day, but it meant that I didn't have to carry extra kit. I didn't have to rely on people having sleeping bags, baby bags, I didn't have to rely on like dehydrated, rehydrated food in like a stove I could get back and have some proper recovery. So yeah, so the setup I had was like a mortar home, uh, which my wife was crewing. And she was also uh, the, Sherpa for basically dropping bikes off and picking bikes up. So I had like a road bike and a mountain bike. So the Landover track, so like, for example, coming out of Ben Ann's like 10K along the Landover track, she had gone up and dropped the mountain bike off for me so I could just cycle out or vice versa. If I was accessing a hill that had a long cycle in, I'd cycle up it and then drop the bike and she'd collect it and take it back. So she was basically doing bike collects and bike drops. And then cooking my meals for me. So, you know, typical breakfast was like uh, almond butter and toast with jam and then a cup of tea. Uh, and then, yeah, evening meals were like pasta, um, bol lentil bolognese, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it worked out. I probably averaged about eight hours sleep a night. Um, and basically when I was in the van, it just meant I had to eat. So literally if I wasn't running and I was in the van, I was eating. And it felt weird at some times when I'd been in the van for a few hours because I had an easier, slightly easier day and I'd done it in like 10, 12 hours and I wasn't eating. It felt a bit weird. I felt like I was like not doing something because I should have been eating. But yeah, uh, it wasn't fun. Like people think eat all you want, anything you want. But my best analogy is like having Christmas dinner every night of the week and going to bed like that kind of really feel but ill kind of feel that you just want to lie on the sofa and just like lie there. That's how much food I was shoveling in because... I was having to, but yeah, it's not nice. It's just a chore. <laughs> does that ring bell, Spike? <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I'm actually, to be honest, I'm, obviously I'm a greedy bug because I actually quite enjoyed the, the eating large amounts. But yeah, but I do what? remember, yeah, it's sort of just wake or going to bed just with a really full stomach. And that was probably almost as much as anything what then got you out of bed in the morning that you'd gone to bed so full you had to, had to empty some of it, yeah. <laughs> How many calories do you think you were you were going through in a day? Uh, me, I would probably been going about maybe seven thousand more. Like the amount I was consuming, and I lost a bit of weight. You know, so I'd have at least wow. been burning like seven, eight thousand calories a day. Yeah. Yeah, because wow. interesting. I don't know how much you carried on the hill, Donny, but but yeah, because my support was um, a, a friend of mine from. from where I was living at the time, a guy called a friend called JC John Clements, who was who was retired and had agreed to drive the van. Um, so I suppose I had a slightly different dynamic in that he wasn't some he was someone I knew from the pub from sharing the odd pint with, but not someone I knew really well. So uh, him him discovering what I could eat and couldn't eat was perhaps part of the part of the, the adventure, if you like. Yeah, but yeah, we sort of had a bit of a sort of code as to what we would eat, which was you know, is it going to be a a four sandwich day, six sandwich day, eight sandwich day. And he would just sort of build, send me off each morning with this sort of stack of sandwiches as to, to what it was going to, you know, and that would tell you how big a day it was going to be. Yeah. And I guess on the really big days, I was pretty much filling up a, a loaf of bread of sandwiches into a rucksack before I set off. Yeah. <laughs> and Donnie, were you, were you eating sandwiches or were you, Actually, I, I saw a picture of your massive stock of, of bars and things. Yeah, so generally, yeah, I'm not really a sandwich person when I'm running. Uh, it was more uh, trek bars and cliff bars with the solid types of food. And then I'd have shot blocks for later on in the day. And then I'd maybe have some caffeine gels towards the end. And then I'd be drinking like uh, active roots. So it's a carbohydrate drink. So it's got like maybe... 40 grams of carbohydrates per 500 mils. So, you know, maybe drinking one of them, depending um, how hot it is. But because it's a powder format, it was great for carrying plenty of calories because you stuff loads of active root into your bag and know you've got loads of calories um, and carbohydrates. So that's actually quite a good way of saving some weight. But I do <laughs> reminisce with a uh, spike when you say like sandwiches full of, yeah, your bag in some mornings would just be weighing a ton. You've got food in every pocket stuffing it and cramming it in, and then you think do i have enough 
I better chuck a couple more bars in just in case. Yeah, because massive long days. I mean, yeah, days that mo most runners don't go out for the, for that long on one day. But you're obviously back to back in them, and and in calorie deficit, as you said, because you lost a bit of weight. Yeah. yeah, yeah, certainly some of the bigger days. I think you're you're right, Donny. You sort of you weren't entirely sure how much how hungry you'd feel because some days you'd be hungrier than others. And I think what you certainly didn't want was sort of to be, I don't know, halfway around Neudart or something like that and sort of getting down to the last bar in your pack and thinking, Oof, you've got to keep going for another six hours or something with, with, with no food left. Yeah. So you tended to carry more food than you probably needed as insurance, I think, I, or at least I did anyway. Yeah. Did either of you suffer from sort of problems with nausea to be able to eat or was the, the pace sort of slow enough that that wasn't? You know, relatively slow enough that that wasn't too much of a problem. Uh, for me, I f found that I was able to eat um, actually all right. The pace wasn't, if anything, I think the first couple of days I might have ate too much. I made myself feel nauseous because I was eating too much. But yeah, I found that found the right level I could eat at, and yeah, never really felt nauseous after maybe the first couple of days when I was like really trying to feel aggressively and I was just leaving myself feeling a bit nauseous, but yeah. Yeah, I think the thing's same here. It's, it, it's the, the pace was never that that hard that you couldn't sort of find time to pull a sandwich out and just munch as you jogged along. Uh, I, I yeah. found it fairly easy to keep eating. <laughs> I, was, I was really interested to talk a bit about the, obviously the bikes, uh, the bike was really important, be getting between peaks and utilizing any any road and track you could. How much, um, I suppose, Donny first? Like, how much do you think you you maximize using the bikes for you know as much as you could? Getting Rachel to take it to places where where you could use it and uh, etc. Yeah, <laughs> I maximize. Like, I took a very scientific approach to planning all this as much scientific as I possible. So. You know, I, I was looking for the most efficient route possible. So I was there, looked at spikes and like I did a bit of variation around the central belt, like around Glen Lyon, just tag in a few, few more Monroe's. But literally, for example, like in Glen Fresh, yeah, I maybe cycled 500 meters of the mountain bike at the start of the day just to get that 500 meters cycling. And, you know, it might have saved me like literally a couple of minutes, but it saved my legs. That's how kind of ridiculous I was on the bike anything I could possibly cycle I was probably trying to cycle it even to the point I actually cycled a bit of the Glen Sheeman roads so I cycled up uh, towards Carnwell uh, up the Land Rover tracks and then just nipped off the bike and got the two uh, either side of uh, Carnwell and Cairn Osta I kind of pretty much cycled them because I could so basically anything to take take the strain off the legs yeah because you you were having to run an awfully long way <laughs> and, and spike yourself with the bike were you were you a mountain bike or were you were you on a road bike on the road and then leaving it um i i, I did have both with me i, I had a mountain bike and a, and a road bike um probably wasn't quite as scientific as donny about it and uh and it partly depended on the on the i guess on the road support and who was there at the time and because at times I didn't want to feel I could lean on JC too much in terms of shipping bike into to various places because I knew I was already leaning on I mean, it. As, as, as favours go, I think he was already doing me a pretty big favour, so uh, I didn't want to push it too hard. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, occasionally, I, yeah, a few places I was able to get sort of friends or JC to, to ferry a bike into to one or two places or to, to fetch it back out again, but yeah. But it was, it was really mainly, I think I used the bike on just the, the, obvious, you know, the very obvious big road sections were, I guess, were the main bits. And the mountain biking was probably fairly limited. I think sort of cycled in and out to sort of places like Gorvan and one or two other hills like that. But yeah. And, and was the bike, um, was the bike, did that feel easy on the legs? Could you take it quite easy on the bike, both of you? Or was that, yeah, did that, did that add up as well? I really enjoyed the biking. It was like, because I was dealing with, uh, well, right and left uh, anterior tibia tendinopathy in the ankles, like cycling was the one of the few things that didn't cause me any pain. And it felt nice at the end of the day just to spin the legs on the bike. So if there was any cycling, I would normally tag it on at the end of the day rather than doing it first thing in the morning. Um, 
So I actually really enjoyed the cycling, uh, really, because it was just like one of the things that was found it quite easy. Uh, and because you're covering a lot of distance quickly, it feels like you're getting somewhere as well on the bike. So yeah, I enjoyed the cycling. Yeah, I mean, I, I fully say that I'm, I'm not a natural cyclist. I must have, I always, if, if there's an option of going out for a bike ride or a run, I'll always go for a run. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I, I, I think I preferred being on, on my feet, but yeah, I never, never found the cycling was hard work. It was always at a pace that was quite relaxed. So I never felt like I wanted to hammer my legs on the bike because yeah, as Danny said earlier, you wanted to save your legs for the hills. So, so if it, the bike rides took me a bit longer than they might have done, I was, I was quite happy with that and just spinning the legs over gently, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, Johnny, um, you mentioned it there. T tell us about that injury because that, that happened quite early on, didn't it? Uh, so yeah, so basically it was day six. Kind of felt it towards the end of day five in Dramochter. I like my right ankle was getting a bit sore down the front. Um, and then day six, it kind of progressively got worse. And thankfully day six, I was in Aviemore that night. So uh, sports massage in Inverness came out and treated it with some uh, massage and some acupuncture, but it was right anterior t tendinopathy in the uh, tendon. So it was just overuse and probably common overuse of running on uneven boggy terrain, which pretty much the majority of the Monroe round does. So. Uh, yeah, that was really painful for about maybe ooh, a good week or so. So I remember coming off Ben Ann on day seven, and that's probably the most pain I've ever been in coming off Monroe. Like every foot hurt, like coming downhill was the worst. And every time I put my right foot down, it was just like bringing tears to my eyes. And I was like, how am I going to get through this? Um, and that was pretty ag agony. Uh, ba but basically, you just had to do the scientific approach of basically ice, elevation, compression. And I had what's called a recovery pump machine. So it's basically big compression bags for your legs. So I'd sit in that every evening and uh, use this machine. So it basically just compressed the legs with air. So it's just basically big air socks that compress the legs and helps flush the, the fluid and the swelling out. So I use that every night. And also it's kind of weird because I knew Andrew Murray when he ran from John O'Groats to the Sahara Desert. And I knew he had Achilles tendinopathy in the first two weeks. But it eventually cleared up. That kind of gave me the confidence to keep trying and keep going, knowing that I might get lucky. It might not necessarily textbook, you know, tending off these an overuse injury, you stop, you let it get better. But I knew there's some cases out there that you can actually manage it. And that's pretty much what I tried to do is just manage it. It never really completely went away, but it got bearable to the point I could manage it and not be in complete agony. Like, I was to the point like I really enjoyed the uphills most of the time and hated the downhills, which are normally the other way about. <laughs> and then on day like 17, the left one, it went exactly the same way, which is obviously probably inevitable because I was favoring my left foot on the downhills after my right one went. And, you know, you just kind of try and firefight and manage it. And then the left went, went on day 17, but that went quick because day 17 started really nice, not, no pain in the left-hand side. And by the end of the day, it was completely agony. And then at that point, I'm like, you've got two sore ankles going downhill, which doesn't really help. <laughs> but again, it was just more kind of managing it. So ice elevation, literally, if I was in the van, I'd have ice in the legs, even if I was stopping for literally two, two minutes. You know, if I was having, like coming in and changing over to the bike and I was like having a cup of tea, I'd have ice on my ankles at any given opportunity. And like I was sleeping my legs elevated and stuff. So yeah. Because I would imagine a lot of people would, you know, would be, you know, I'm in agony. I know what it's going to be like. It's going to flare up again tomorrow. I need to rest it. That, that sounds, that must have been really difficult psychologically to sort of, yeah, like you said, you were managing it, but then to just go out the next day and, and do another 60, 70 K or more. Yeah. And I, I suppose from my point, question I got done is, I, I guess you, you pretty, by the sounds of you obviously understood what the injury was, but were you not concerned you were just making it worse and worse and sort of uh, and progressively getting worse or, or, or what, what gave you the because I could well it's one thing running through the agony it's also the psychological knowing you're not making the problem worse every day I, I uh, manage that <laughs> yeah I think it's just like I say that confidence of knowing Andrew and knowing what he went through on the um, Scotland uh, John O'Groats to the Sahara where he basically ran down the A9 and 
on into like France. And I know I've seen his when he, he ran through Edinburgh, his Achilles were really inflamed and in agony, but, but I met him in Morocco and he was fine. Um, so I kind of took a bit of confidence from that and also kind of, you know, cause I persevered, like I was finding ways around it. So obviously after day seven coming off Ben Ann, where I was in complete agony, uh, the next day was like less downhill. So it was like Mount Keen, which I was able to cycle fairly close to Loch Nagar, which is fairly flat once you're up and then you've got one steep downhill. And then Glen Shea again. So they, them three days kind of fell in quite well. There wasn't any massive big downhills because once you're up high on these days, you, you're keeping the keeping the height. It was mainly the downhills that would aggravate it, especially the off-trail downhills, so like the really hard kind of boggy downhills where you, your foot's getting pronated out or inwards. Um, but yeah, I think with something this long, you get used to managing it. It never goes away, but for some reason, your body seems to be kind of be able to dull the pain or manage it. But like, you know, they were massive by the end of the Monroe round. Like my tendons were huge, like really red, really inflamed every day on both sides. Uh, but I think it gets to the point with tendonopathy, it can't get any worse, really. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's and medical. How, how, you it's medical. <laughs> and and how, 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 has the, how have the tendons been since then, Donny, over the last six months? They've been fine. Like obviously they were sore once I stopped. Like, well, not sore once I stopped, but as in if I ran like the week after, two weeks after, they were a bit nippy. I think it was like maybe three weeks after that it was like almost back to normal. I'd be aware of it, but it wasn't sore. And then I broke my ribs and I was out for six weeks of running anyway. So by the time I came back from that, they've been fine and not bothered me since. Yeah. Maybe it's inevitable that you're going to get some kind of niggle or injury on, on such a long thing. Um, did I, I read? Did you have a sort of tendonitis thing as well, Spike? Yeah, I did. I mean, the, I think mine pales into the significance of every Dunny's. I think mine was. Um, I mean, I realised mine was actually sort of slightly self-inflicted because um, probably slightly longer into it, but probably about two weeks in, I sort of started to feel like uh i can't remember she was the left or right now but one of my like killings and quite inflamed again i just thought it was I'd put it over you that's why i've never done sort of the these big back to, just as done just yeah going start to get pretty uncomfortable I mean, certainly never to the extent that I was in agony that it was with mine, that, that the shoes were, I made a bit of a cock up on the shoes because I'd a half cycle than I normally did. It was actually the, the Achilles heel type was actually slightly on my Achilles. And so basically got back to the van night and I basically took the scissors to the Achilles tab and really chopped the sort of big notch in them um, and I found once I'd done that although I was part of discomfort probably for yeah three or four days I you know I now understood what the problem was which I think psychologically the main thing and then over the course of the next week it settled down and pretty much after that no problems at all yeah great Do um, Donnie uh, well both of you but maybe Donnie we'll go back to Donnie first about um what were the what were the highlights of the of the journey? As if you had to pick out a few days or kind of uh, experiences, what would you what would you say? Sky uh, by far the best day. Like I got it on like a really nice day. Um, blue skies, cloud coming in night a wee bit, and I was with a couple of friends uh, on Sky, John Smith and Jordan Young. And I said it in previous interviews. It didn't feel like part of the Monroe round. It's probably one of the few days I didn't really look at my watch that much. Think. What time am I going to get off the hill? What time am I going to hit the next one roll? You know, how long have I got to go? What am I going to eat? I was just literally, I was out enjoying myself, having fun in the coolings, taking in the views, having a chat with friends, just joking about, messing about, really. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was by far the, the best highlight of the round. Um, another highlight would have been Neudart. Um like never done the Nordic Dark Monroes, and thankfully I didn't wreck them because they're absolutely brutal. Uh, like um, it knocked me on my ass 
like physically like I came out of that day and I was like I am completely smashed um, so now Dart is like eight minerals, 60 odd K with 6,000 meters of ascent and it is rough, it's rugged, it's remote. Um, and start the day, it was like really wet, torrential rain, then it dried up mid morning. Uh, so got a wee bit of view and then in the afternoon, the weather um, crapped out again and it went back to like raining and horizontal rain to the point like I'd planned the day I'd took in two waterproof jackets and like a couple of dry tops and I went through all of that stuff just keeping warm up and high because the weather was that rubbish and I made a school of error I've got a pack of head torch and like it made me run the last bit a bit quicker to get off before it went dark I was like racing the darkness I was like halfway around oh, rubbish I forgot my head torch I'm like trying to calculate how much daylight I've got left, how much terrain have I got to go, and trying to figure out, am I going to make it back? Am I going to be running off the hill using my, like, torch on my mobile phone kind of thing? <laughs> but, yeah, I made it back just before darkness, thankfully. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, and predictably, what, any low points particularly? Um, I guess being in agony would be, would be pretty rubbish. But, um, yeah. <laughs> when you had your injury um, but yeah what would you say was the kind of lowest point so day 17 was definitely the lowest point kind of going into this like how I was psychologically prepared for it so kind of using sports psychology I visualized the whole Monroe round at the start being miserable so I, I visualized being out for like 14 hours a day being one of the wettest windiest Scottish summers imaginable because we've just been out and horizontal rain all the time, hating every minute of it. I really kind of tried to visualize all that, knowing that, you know, that's worst case scenario, but anything better is going to be a bonus. And I had actually great weather, you know, I had almost near perfect weather as you're going to get in the Scottish weather kind of summer. Um, and then again, also I knew the crux of most multi-day things like this is like the middle you're so far away from the start and so far away from the finish that's like groundhog day so that's kind of building into around about day 17 and like three or four days before i was just like doing big day big day big day and i wasn't seeing any reward for it i was just getting tired and tired and more fatigued and i couldn't see any light shining on ben hope which was the last one all the way up in sutherland um so it was kind of these combination factors and like it was day 17. So I started at Kruken and I was traversing all the way over to um, Glencoe Ski Resort. So basically I was 11 Monroe's. Um, yeah, and like my, what kind of set off was my left ankle went. Uh, and that's the, day the left one went. And all I could imagine was the pain I went through on my right hand side for the next like week that happening on my left and I had no easy days like in the Eastern Care and Gorms the days were slightly easier because once you're up high you're up high for most of the day in the Eastern Care and, well Eastern Care and Gorms and Eastern Monroe's but like a big day after big day going through Glencoe and uh, Memoirs then on into Novi Dark so yeah that's kind of where I kind of went and then also what set me off the lowest point was I was coming up to Stop Gore which is second, second last Monroe and for some reason, I've never done these two Monroes. I've done them on a ski tour, but I've never done them running. And like, I thought it was just a wee dip down and then up and then down onto the West Island Way. And I got to stop going and I was just like, oh, no. Like, worst case scenario, like big rocky descent, which is not great for any of your ankles. And then like a big climb back up to stop Corriora. And then I was just like, oh, this is rubbish. Like, to the point, I was like, I hate it, not enjoying myself don't want to do it, got back to the van on day 17. And I actually said to Rachel, like, I could go home. Like, I'm not enjoying it anymore. Just let's just go home. Um, it's not serious because at that point, it's like three or four days up in the schedule. So in theory, I could take like two or three days, stay in the Glencoe, rest my ankles, you know, just relax. But as that's how I was feeling. Um, but the next day I got up and went up um Male booty and crease, and I was meant to go on to Brickleton Moor and traverse out to Ben Schoolard, but I kind of mixed them days up to try and spend a bit of time in the bikes. So I went and did um, Anna, not the uh, Anna Higa, I was supposed to say Anna Moor, Anna Higa, and um, two Monroe's at Balahulish because that would kind of split up 
two monroes cycle, two monroes cycle. So that kind of helped manage it. These were the kind of things I was trying to think about to manage the injury a bit more. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I got through day 17. And people ask me, why, how do you keep going? It's like routine. You know, it's like you have a bad day at work, but you get up the next day and you go to work. And that's what I was doing in the Monroe round. I'd get up at 5 a.m. I'd have my breakfast. I'd be running by six or walking or crawling by six. And that's what I did. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, so you just you just had to keep keep going with it. And, yeah, uh, keep so going, try and refocus, try, try and break it down to like one Monroe at a time, one day at a time, and not try and think about the big picture. Yeah, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other for as far as you could go, for as long as you could go, pretty much, was it like the mantra, so yeah. Spike, how about, how about yourself with sort of highs and lows, anything that sticks out uh, 10 years later um, is kind of really memorable? Yeah, I mean, it, inevitably, it, over 30, 40 days, you're going to get some great, great days out. Um, and I suppose in my memory, so certain days that stick out, I guess, as we were talking before the, or before we, the recording started of this was uh, with, with the weather now. Um, when I started much earlier in the year than Donny, it was sort of, I started at the end of April. Um, and I think 20, the winter of 2010 was probably the last big winter we've had with, with the amount of snow. Um, so there was certainly, well, actually pretty much throughout the round, there was still plenty of pretty large snow patches, but it meant that um, going around the Cairngorms on probably the first, I think it was on the 2nd of May on the, on the Eastern Cairngorms, um, it was sort of, conditions that were would have been fantastic to ski touring and the, the only people we saw on that day were, were, were people out on skis um sort of you know you can just imagine it sort of a running around sort of a, a, a cold easterly wind and in deep snow running around the Cairngorms that was yeah, but it actually with, with a couple of really good friends Mike Nelson and Digby so it, as we sort of emerged up on onto the Cairngorm plateau and looking up at Ben McDewey it was you know, knowing that there was 10, 12 hours ahead of this, it was pretty daunting. But actually, in fact, as the day wore on, it didn't get much colder than that. And, and the weather stayed clear and we got fantastic sunsets towards the end of the day. And I think probably of all the all the days, that was the most memorable. A classic, classic day out. So, you know, this classic mountain day out with good, good friends. And yeah. And have the, uh, have any low points, have they sort of... Uh melted away from your memory I, I think i think they do like most most of these i think we all know that you know the highs tend to be the things that stick in your memory and the, the sort of the painful elements sort of shrink away fairly quickly so yeah and i, I mean i as, as donnie said i know there were, there were days when you were pretty knackered and think yeah this is a grind but somehow I think it did become a bit of a routine. It was, as Donnie said, yeah, it's like going to work. There wasn't a lot else to think about. You'd get up in the morning and, I mean, you know, normally when you're going out, you sort of look out of the, the window and think, oh, am I going to go out today or not? Whereas there wasn't really that option. It was, you got up, you got going and off you went. Um, so yeah, I guess it must have been a grind in the middle, but I don't recall that side of it particularly. And my, to be honest, I look back and think most days there was something memorable about each day, I think. And, and enjoyable. I would like to ask Donny about your final push. So you, <laughs> you were doing these massive days. You'd scheduled these absolutely huge days, um, and, and then you went and put um, four days of your schedule into forty-eight hours. Yeah, <laughs> that, that kind of snowball that didn't go to plan. <laughs> um... All the all the people watching the tracker, the dot watchers. As we call them, we're just going going mentally. Like, he's keeping going. He's keeping going. Yeah. yeah. Well, I admit, Donnie, you said you were going to have a. You might see how it went when I left you in the Torridons, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, as I said, I had a schedule for about thirty-three days, but coming off Neudart, I was completely smashed and broken. And then on the following day, I was meant to do like um, South Shield. So I was meant to do the Monroe's on the other side of Kinloch Horn, and then going to do South Shield, uh, and the weather was miserable. So the weather was like horizontal rain and I was completely fatigued. And I knew I was gonna have a drop a day somewhere just cause I was like running on empty. And like I did um, Speedy and Miak, I think it is, uh, coming off that and like, 
I knew I could go and do South Shield Ridge plus the saddle and get into a Glen Elg. But I was like, well, what's the point in doing that? Because I would probably have to take a rest day the following day. You know, what's the point in battling the weather? Should I just cut my losses today, stop at Clooney, finish about maybe two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, have a good rest, and then start again tomorrow and just set the weather out? So that's kind of what I did. That was my mindset for him dropping that day. It was like, I knew a day was coming I was going to have to drop. Because it was big day after big day from... Noider, and I was just so fatigued and I thought well I might as well drop a day when the weather's miserable it's blowing a gale rather than just trying to battle it um, so coming into the last four days I was thinking how can I make my day back um, and so basically it was a Sunday um, I did the Torridon Monroe's and it's like an easy day it was like Ben Algain um, Leotak and uh, Ben Eyre so I did them in rows and I was done by late afternoon. I had a sports massage and I was kind of thinking, okay, I had Fisher Fields and Ancelic to do in one day. Then the following day I was meant to do the Fanax and Ben Wevis. Day after that, I was meant to do like, um, uh, what was it? Uh, name's gone for me. Um, oh, Connie Val and Ben Jerry sorry. Okay. Yeah, ben Jerry Group, Ben Moore Ascent and Conneville, and then the last day, Ben Hope, Ben Kilbrack and Ben Hope. So that's kind of like the four days split down. Um, so I thought if I did the Fisher Fields and Ancelic in one day, and then do Fanex with us and the Ben Jerry Group on another day, and then Ben Moore Ascent, Conneville, Ben Kilbrack and Ben Hope in the last day, that would get me back onto my 33 day schedule or thereabout. So that's the plan I started on Monday morning when I headed into the Fisher Fields. And going to the Fisher Fields, I did Sleok first and then I'm into the Fisher Fields. And sat around the Fisher Fields, I was thinking, that's quite a nice day. Like the weather was getting better as the day went on, the views were nice. And I was actually feeling not too bad. So I had like a good afternoon off, good sleep, I had about 10 hours sleep. And like I knew the weather was going to change on the Wednesday. And I was like, okay, should I just keep going and do the Fanus? And I was like, so I made a couple of phone calls to see if I could get a better update on when the weather was going to change on the Wednesday. And by that point, I already made my mind up. I was like, okay, I'm just going to go and do the fan of some Monday night and take it from there. Uh, and kind of my mindset by that point was, okay, let's see how much I can get done before the weather breaks on Wednesday. And I knew I had nothing to lose. So basically, if I had to take a, like a day off, I'd still have broken Spikes' record by that point. Um, so I was like, okay, let's just see how far I can push myself physically. And that was more about what the Monroe round was about anyway. It's about seeing how far and how far I could push myself physically and mentally. And it was like, okay, well, I've got to the last four days or whatever it was in the Fisher Fields. And like, well, let's empty the tank. Let's just see what, what I can do. And I know from previous experiences, I've been able to run for like 40 hours straight, like without any sleep. So I was like, okay, let's just see how if I can. Monday night at the, the fish, uh, the Fanus, uh, which was really great. <laughs> um, and then came off the Fanus just just after midnight, I think it was, on the Fanus estate, cycled out onto the road, um, and then went on did Ben Wivis. I think I summoned to Ben Wivis about four in the morning or something like that. It was really cold, and then got back to Ben Wivis, got back to Ben Wivis car park just before daylight, and I was like, okay, you know. I could have slept and I was thinking, well, I know once daylight comes up, you feel more awake. So I was like, okay, I'll wait for daylight, which is about half an hour. So I just laid down for half an hour, just wait for daylight so I'd feel more awake. And then once daylight came up, I cycled up to the Olipil Road and then went and did Anfokach and, and then on to Benjeric. Thinking, okay, I'll just keep going and see how far I can get. Um, so I did that and came out at Oakle Bridge after Sean um, and went cycled to Ben Moore. Ben Moore, Ascent and Carnival. So I did them too. And that was coming into, what day was that, Monday, Tuesday night now, Tuesday evening. Um, and that was, I was getting tired by that point. Like I was really kind of like getting tired. So that was this Tuesday evening about 6 p.m. I came off Carnival maybe about 6, 7 p.m. And I thought, okay, I'll just have a wee lie down. But I had a friend come and join me for cycling, uh, to cycle like the 80K up to Ben Kilbrack. And I'm like, 
if he's come to cycle me, I can't really keep him waiting while I lie down. So it's like, well, I better just jump on the bike and cycle since he's going to cycle with me. So that's how it ended up. I was like, well, I can't let people come to cycle with me wait. So I was like, okay, I'll just have some food. Give me like 10 minutes, get me, get my, some food together, get myself together and jump on the bike. And that cycle was, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty brutal. That cycle up to come bank or back. It's like trying to stay on the bike and not run into the verge because you're falling asleep on the bike. So yeah, there's a few times like the bike would start swaying and then you just kind of catch it before you hit the verge. And then, yeah, I got to Benko Black about maybe 11 o'clock at night. And yeah, it was pretty much by that point, it's like, okay, let's just keep going. I know I can do it. So did Benko Black and then headed on to Ben Hope. And I originally thought I'll wait till sunrise and get some nice footage because I was filming for the venture show. So like, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll wait. I think I had an hour in the van just sitting drinking tea waiting for like... I think sunrise would have been just about half past five. Um, so I was like waiting. But yeah, I kind of started off. I can't remember what time I would have started off for. I think I gave myself an hour or so. But it turned out like the weather was pretty miserable. I knew there wasn't going to be a sunrise. And like with 400 meters to go, I was like, I could finish on a round number. So I was kind of like aiming. So I realized like with 500, 400 meters to go or something like that, I could finish at or, like on. 31 days and 23 hours and that was like oh that'd be cool that'd be a nice and round number so I kind of like sprinted the last 400 meters in like 20 minutes and missed it by two minutes and that kind of <laughs> that was it really that was how the final push went ahead but yeah uh, it was a big couple of days yeah <laughs> gee I, I don't even know how to put that into context for anyone like that 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 two yeah that 48 hours was like such a massive like massive ranges, the Fanex, the Ben Jerry group, the Fisher Fields, uh, and cycling between them, sleep deprived. It's absolutely massive. <laughs> but yeah, you did it. <laughs> yeah, you could probably just say like the previous 28 days was training for the last four days, really. So I'd just been training for the last four days. <laughs> so you get to the top of Ben Hope. What, what time is it about? Is that about midnight? Uh, so Ben Hope would have been uh, five in the morning or okay. two minutes past five in the morning because I started at six okay. uh, in the morning in Oban. Uh, so yeah, that's how. So I was planning to be about half past five because that would have been sunrise and I would have made some nice shots. But yeah, it wasn't turned out. It was kind of windy, dark, misty, grizzly. So yeah, it's kind of like everything Scottish. So. And you had... Was that about half a dozen people there, or what? Was yeah, so like? yeah, I had a few people there. So there was Simon Willis, who was cameraman for the event show. Uh, there was someone else from Highland Hill Runners up there. Then Rachel and Ali Bevan were on the summit, and then I had a few runners that were coming up with me, but I dropped them when I decided to try and make twenty-three hours. So basically, I think there was maybe about another five people that were doing the last minute with me, and then I was like dropped them i did i did say at the time i'm going to try and get 23 hours and run this last 400 meters as fast as i can um let's i have no idea about like take four steps and just end up walking again but i managed to run it i have no idea where i got the energy from so this is day 31 you've just done 48 hours in a row <laughs> and you dropped your support runners yeah <laughs> and you're still pushing so right to the very final summit care yeah, I think that's just my nature. It's just keep pushing myself, like see how far, see how fast I can push it. So like you knew you got to Ben Hope, it's like, let's just empty the tank again. Like there's still stuff in the legs. Uh, you know, it's kind of crazy how far you can push yourself physically when you kind of just keep going and just kind of break down the barriers. What was your first thought when you finished, when you touched that summit period? Well, my first thought was bugger and mystics. That's what was caught on camera. Uh, and they couldn't figure out what I'd missed and it turned out I'd missed it by two minutes because I was kind of like trying to make it 23 so the first thought was like bugger I missed it <laughs> was the first two words I said when I touched the card um, but yeah it was, yeah. I, I would imagine the the uh, capacity for, for full celebration at five in the morning cold and damp sleep deprived was probably uh we probably had limited capacity to fully celebrate up there. <laughs> it was a weird feeling. I don't know if you felt that like that spike. It was kind of like a, 
a sad but happy ending. It was like you were glad it was finished, but then you're also sad it was like an end of like for me anyway. It was like over 12 months of planning and like such focus for most of the six months leading into it and then the whole journey. And you knew that was coming to an end. So it was kind of like a hinge of, hinge of sadness, but also you were glad to have made it. That's kind of the feeling I had in Ben Hope. It was like, yes, I'm so happy I've made it, but yet yeah, I'm quite sad that that's it all over now. I don't know if that's how you felt, Spike. Yeah, I mean, not, not immediately, because I mean, my finish is a bit different. I had a sort of a nice leisurely get up at the foot of Benkley Wreck and cycle, yeah, cycle around and uh, strolled up strolled up there at three in the afternoon on a nice sunny day um, and I think yeah we sort of because of that we sort of there was a bottle of champagne opened and we stood around and chatted a bit and that was nice enough walking down but I think yeah the next I then sort of stayed up with a couple of friends up at Durness for the next couple of days and yeah what I thought was going to be just sort of yeah sort of relax and celebrate and enjoy it it sort of ends up sort of slightly got anticlimax and almost a bit empty then because suddenly you're not waking up at five or six in the morning sort of with a purpose in mind you're sort of yeah what do, what do i do now what, what's what's next so it almost felt a little bit empty i think yeah you sort of like taken away and there was nothing you were really looking forward to then after that you have been so focused on this, yeah, on this challenge for over a month. And then, yeah, suddenly it, yeah. you complete it, it, it's finished. Yeah, and I, and I suppose with me as well, yeah, you know, there was, I, I suppose it was a period of life where I sort of, um, yeah, my, my opportunity to do the round had been because I'd been made redundant, and which was a good thing. You know, I, I wasn't, you know, a, a positive in that sense. It gave me that opportunity. Um, but I guess as soon as, as soon as the sort of focus of the Monroe round was finished as well, I sort of was thought, well, I put this off and been spending all my redundancy money over the last few months. I'm going to have to get back home now and start looking for work. And so there's a little bit also, I suppose, yeah, of uh, reality hits again now after after that sort of interlude on the Monroe round. And I read that there was um, something waiting for you, Donny, on the on the cairn of Ben Hope. Yeah, um, yeah, Spike had uh, managed to get a bottle of Jura up there for me. So yeah, that kind of warmed me up at 5 a.m. I wasn't sure that was the best recovery drink to have after 48 hours of um, Monroe bagging. But yeah, I did have a wee dram up there. Um, definitely warmed the cockles up. <laughs> and then, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that continuing a tradition, Spike? It was, yeah, no, because exactly the same had happened to me. So when I got to the... To the summit cairn at Ben Hope, there was uh, someone discovered a yeah a package that Charlie Campbell had gone up there a few days previously and left a bottle of whiskey. So yeah, so I thought yeah, there's there's not too many rules and traditions with the Monroe round, but I thought that's probably quite a nice one to keep up. So yeah, the only disappointment I think for Donny was it was a bottle of Jura and not a, a Sky whiskey. But I'm afraid <laughs> there was no disappointment. Yeah. It went down nicely. Oh, don't have five air, thank you, but they go down nicely. <laughs> maybe the Jura is a suggestion of like um, the Corbett round, maybe it should be next on the radar. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that one to Spike. <laughs> yeah, I might leave that. I'll leave that with Manny Gorman. I think he's still got that record, doesn't he? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely brilliant to chat about this. Uh, both of you, I mean, just sounds like you know, what really comes across is just these, these amazing personal experiences, like, you know, over a month in the hills. Uh, yeah, just such a huge, a huge achievement. Um, it's been really cool finding out a bit more about it. And, uh, you know, you, both of your, uh, you know, love of, of, of the memory, well, love of doing it, love of, the, you know, the memory of it, uh, you know, has totally shone through. Um, thanks really much for talking to us. Thanks for having us on. It's great. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much, Finley. It's been uh, been really good talking to it. And as you say, there's, there are ultimately when all the pain's gone, it's the fantastic memories that you remember, and getting opportunities to relive those is uh, is, is great. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll end it there. Uh, I will just sign off. Thanks very much, um, Fort William Mountain Festival. 
I'll put this on my um, podcast, Go Mountain Goats, uh, as well. And yeah, cheers, everyone. <laughs>